Anyone on the water board team, would you just confirm that you can hear me? <clears throat> Hi, this is Elizabeth, I can hear you. Great, thank you. You look great, Karen, sound good. It's all coming through. Great, 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 great. Looks like we're getting people logged in. I'm gonna give it another minute or so, and then we'll go ahead and start with the instructions for participants. We don't see a bunch of people in our waiting room at the moment. And I do see lots of people having logged in. Looks good. Um, all right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, those of you on the water board team, would you share your video for the very beginning of this so I can introduce you all in a second? But first I will start with instructions for participants who are participating in the Zoom meeting. If you're on the webcast, you are hearing this as a delay um, of, I don't know how long, but uh, it tends to be delayed um, by a few seconds, if not more. Um, those of you on Zoom will hear it pretty close to the time that I'm speaking it. So welcome to our workshop on the, what are we calling this? The second revised, what is this? Yes, the second revised draft of the Water Quality Control Plan for Inland Surface Waters Enclosed Bays and Estuaries Toxicity Provision um, released on July 7th. Um, hopefully you're at the right workshop. Um, we do have one participant that is showing their video at this point. Not that I mind seeing Josh, but our plan was to not show video until folks were speaking. So I'm going to have our team turn you off for a minute, Josh. All right. So um, if you're participating via Zoom, we're going to keep you muted and your video off until uh, it is time for you to speak or ask questions. Um, the method by which you can do that will be via raising your hand. Um, and so we are going to just go through, I know there's a number of folks who have already requested um, the ability to speak. And so we're just gonna go by the raise hand function. Um, to do that, you need to open the participant list. And at the bottom of the participant list, there is a number of options, including to raise your hand. So um, we will go through the presentation completely and keep everyone muted and videos off until the end of the presentation, at which time we will then work through the list of folks who have their hand raised and, um, and open your video if you choose to, as well as your audio. Obviously you need audio in order to make comments. Um, uh, so you can make your comments. We also have the ability for folks who are on the webcast or um, listening separately in some fashion to send and don't want to speak in the Zoom meeting to send, uh, send questions or comments in via email and that email address is on this first slide. Um, if you're joining via the phone number, it's listed here, including the meeting ID. So you're welcome to do that um, as well. Uh, when you log in, it will ask you to um, connect yourself to your video as well. And um, please try to name yourself so we know who you are. So you can rename yourself in the participant list. Um, find your phone number and rename it with your name so that if you are wanting to speak, we can tell who you are. You don't have to guess by your phone number. Um, we are recording this session. And so if you do not want your video to be recorded, then you, you may choose not to start your video when you make comments, but your um, comments 
any comments that you make during the meeting will be recorded. Um, Katie, John, Zane, have I forgotten anything? I don't think so. No. All right, then I'm gonna go ahead and introduce my team. I'm Karen Mogus, I should have started with that. I'm the Deputy Director of the Division of Water Quality, the Executive uh, at the State Water Board. I'm the Executive Sponsor of this project and I'll be presenting uh, the, the changes to the provisions today. Um, we also have Rebecca Fitzgerald, Chief of our Standards and Planning Unit, uh, section, sorry. Uh, Zane Paulson, our uh, Chief of our Standards Unit and the uh, Senior Lead of this project. We have Rich Brewer, Environmental Program Manager, who has been instrumental in uh, a lot of the research and technical work, as well as response to comments on the um, project. Elizabeth Barrett from our Office of Chief Counsel, our lead uh, attorney on the project. Katie Fong, our lead do everything under the sun. <laughs> Environmental scientist in uh, Zane's uh, group and uh, very uh, instrumental in getting this project to where it is. Uh, I don't see John's video anymore, but John Wheeler, also uh, our go-to for all things, everything um, that we need on the project. He is also monitoring our email today and will be helping with um, comments. And I believe we also have Phil Wiles from Office of Chief Counsel, our Assistant Chief Counsel um, on the line as well. And Did Jacob. I miss anybody? I don't oh, Jacob, Jacob, yes. Jacob um, Iverson is also on our team, environmental scientist in Zane's unit. And he is uh, our master of ceremonies today. So he will be the one that uh, will be admitting folks and turning on video and audio and whatnot. Um, so uh, he's also in the background, no video today. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started on the presentation, um, unless my team has anything else to add before I get going. All right. Um, Hopefully y'all can see the presentation. I'm assuming you can. I'm going to, hopefully, there we go. Give me a thumbs up that you see the first slide. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, so I've already said this is the public staff workshop on the second revised draft of the toxicity provisions that will be included in the inland surface waters enclosed bays and estuaries plan as a statewide water quality control plan um, that will be considered for adoption by the State Water Board. Um, again, the questions, if you're logging in or viewing via uh, the uh, webcast, you can use this email address to um, submit any questions. So the purpose of today's workshop is to provide an overview of the significant changes that we made since the October 2018 version of the draft provision. Uh, and I'll go into the timeline of how we got to where we are today because other drafts have been made available since then as well. Um, but I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, we'll be discussing the resolution of what we were calling the three big ticket items from our workshop that we held back in October of 2019 as well as just br uh, briefly going over 15 other notable changes that we made since the 2018 version of the provisions. And uh, if you have not already done so, the documents and additional information, including the response to comments, is available at the link at the bottom of this slide. All right, by way of a quick background, uh, just to orient you and let you know how we got to where we are. Um, we didn't start with the early, uh, early stages of this project, which actually had begun back in about 2003. So we're just gonna restart the clock at October of 2018 when we released the 
draft toxicity provisions for the first round of public comment. We held a public hearing before the State Water Board in November of 2018, and then released a revised, a first revised draft of the toxicity provisions back in July, about a year ago um, of 2019. And that draft was released um, not for formal public comment because at that time, the changes that had been made were not significant enough to warrant an additional um, public comment period. However, we did hold a workshop on that version of the provisions in October of 2019 before the State Water Board and uh, heard comments both from the board as well as stakeholders at that workshop and have since made a number of changes to the provisions based on those comments and input from the board. We also in December of last year released the two additional appendices to the staff report, Appendix J and Appendix K for public comment. And uh, that public comment period ended on February 10th of 2020. Um, and those two appendices were added to provide the public with the opportunity to look at some of the additional publications that we were relying on for justifying some of the uh, portions of the provisions, the TST in particular, as well as staff analysis of data that uh, had been done after the release of the 2018 version of the provisions. And then Appendix K is just a documentation of the survey that we conducted of labs uh, back in the spring of 2019 uh, to also justify some of the um, components of the provisions. Um, you'll note though that we have not yet responded to comments on Appendix J and K. The responses to those comments will be included in the next round of response to comments on this current version of the toxicity provision, which was released on July 7th of this year, uh, just earlier this month. Um, hopefully you have it in hand and are prepared to uh, ask any questions that you have on the changes that we have made. Today is really to go through those changes and make sure everyone understands them as you prepare to um, submit comments on this next round. Um, please note though that the comments that we will be considering and responding to during this round of um, public comment are only going to be on the revisions that have been made since the 2018 version. So it's a limited scope of um, comments that we will be both considering and responding to. Um, we released the response to comments on the 2018 version on July 22nd, just a week ago. And then um, the end of the public comment period for this round of comments is 12 noon on August 24th, 2020. We will not be holding any additional workshops or hearings before the State Water Board, um, but we do plan to hold a, a meeting for the State Board to consider adoption of the final draft of the toxicity provisions, hopefully in December of this year. So just Quickly going over what the toxicity provisions do, they set numeric water quality objectives for both chronic and acute toxicity, uh, establishes a single statistical approach, the test of significant toxicity for assessing toxicity data. It establishes, the provisions establish a program of implementation focused on non-stormwater NPDES dischargers, uh, so POTWs, industrial dischargers, other dischargers that are not of the uh, that are not stormwater uh, dischargers, and uh, will be included in the statewide water quality control plan for inland surface waters and closed bays and estuaries of California. And I'll say it one time during this presentation: it is affectionately known as the SWEBI. Um, all right, so you'll recall 
we had a, a few big ticket items that we were uh, wrestling with back in the fall of last year. Um, and these are the, the big ticket items and we have some proposed resolutions for those in the draft provisions, uh, chronic toxicity monitoring requirements and effluent limitations, reasonable potential threshold, and then the use of stereodaphnia reproduction test for um, toxicity um, and, and the, during the, the study that we're proposing. And I'll get into all of these in just a minute. So starting with chronic toxicity monitoring requirements and effluent limitations, uh, those of you who have been involved will recall that the October 2018 version of the provision required, proposed to require POTW dischargers that are authorized to discharge at a rate of greater than uh, 5 MGD million gallons per day were required to have chronic toxicity effluent limitations and monitoring requirements without the necess without requiring a reasonable potential analysis first. In other words, given um, effluent limitations uh, based on the fact that they discharge greater than 5 MGD. At that time, we um, were using 5 MGD as the threshold because that is also the threshold that as uh, US EPA then requires a pretreatment program. We subsequently um, did some more research and found that uh, not all dischargers greater than 5 MGD are required to have a pretreatment program. And the idea there is that if you have a pretreatment program, you have more than just municipal wastewater um, coming into your plant, that you have some industrial uh, sources in your sewer shed and collection system. And so that the, uh, the influent wastewater is less predictable than um, POTWs with just uh, municipal wastewater, domestic wastewater coming in. Um, so the change that we have made is that um, POTWs that are authorized to discharge at a rate of greater than 5 MGD and are required to have a pretreatment program will get effluent limitations and monitoring requirements without first conducting a reasonable potential analysis. So that's the change that we made. We included that they actually are required to have a pretreatment program um, in the language. The next issue is the threshold at which we identify a, a discharger has reasonable potential. You'll recall in the October 2018 version that reasonable potential exists if uh, if a toxicity test, chronic or acute, results in a fail at the in-stream waste concentration, a fail of the TST that is, or the percent effect is greater than 10%. Um, and we require the use of toxicity data within the five years of permit issuance, reissuance or reopening, and at least a minimum of four tests using table one species conducted at the in-stream waste concentration and analyzed using the TST be analyzed to determine whether the discharge has reasonable potential. And our proposal based on the comments that we received and the input that we got from board members was that we were not going to change these thresholds for reasonable potential. And so there is no change to, uh, to this portion of the provision. I'm gonna assume my team will correct me if I say anything wrong. So please do um, do uh, let me know if I've misspoken. Um, the third issue is the use of the stereodaphnia chronic reproduction toxicity test during the stereodaphnia study that we proposed. So as you will recall, back in uh, last summer, fall timeframe, um, we proposed to conduct a study of the variability that is observed in conducting the serodaphnia reproduction test and whether there would be um, ways that we could tighten up the method and implementation of the method in California to improve, excuse me, improve on the variability that um, was observed. Um, the question then becomes, uh, what do we do in the interim period while we're conducting the study? 
And so we have four possible scenarios for permits that are issued, renewed, or reopened during this time frame between the beginning of the study, which we're already we're getting ready to send kickoff letters shortly, um, until uh, December 31st of 2023, which is the proposed date when this portion of the toxicity provisions would become inoperable. In other words, we're putting a date into the provisions of December of 2023 by which um, we intend for the study to be completed and any recommendations from the study be um, available and uh, so that there's some incentive to complete the study and not be continuing to work on the provisions for the next 16 years. Um, and as I already mentioned, the study is intended to investigate test conditions and factors to reduce the within test variability and increase the confidence in the outcome and comparability of the chronic steroid apnea reproduction test. So now I'm gonna go over the four possible scenarios uh, for permits that are issued in this interim period. The first one is if a permit currently does not have numeric effluent limitations for toxicity, aquatic toxicity in, the, in their current permit. And upon reissuance, the most sensitive species identified is the is seriodaphnia. Um, what we're proposing in this instance is that we would issue or include in the permit the maximum daily effluent limitation for seriodaphnia, but a, a monthly median effluent um, target uh, using seriodaphnia. Um, the idea there being that the monthly median effluent target would function the same as the monthly median effluent limitation, but would not result in violations of, um, of permit requirements, um, but could trigger a toxicity reduction evaluation. So that's the first scenario. Don't view these as um, options. These are um, scenarios based on what the current permit requires. So the second scenario is where a current permit has no numeric effluent limitations for aquatic toxicity. But during permit reissuance, the most sensitive species is identified as a, another test species that's not seriodaphnia. What we propose is that the reissued permit will, or the renewed permit, will include the maximum daily effluent limitation and the monthly median effluent limitation using the most sensitive species uh, that was identified. So in other words, no change from how the provisions are currently structured um, will be implemented with that other test species. In the third scenario, the current permit does include numeric effluent limitations for aquatic toxicity. And the most sensitive species identified during permit reissuance is the stereodaphnia. And so we have a couple of options for how to address effluent limitations under this scenario. The first option is to include the maximum daily and monthly median effluent limitations using stereodaphnia just as the provisions are structured currently. Or the second option is to include the maximum daily effluent limitation using seriodaphnia, the monthly median effluent limitation using the next applicable test species, so the next most sensitive species, and then the monthly median effluent target using the seriodaphnia dubia. Um, so obviously the trade-off with option two is you don't have monthly median effluent limitations for stereodaphnia and therefore no violations of the MMEL using stereodaphnia, but additional monitoring would be required using another species to assess compliance with the monthly median effluent limitation. And finally, the fourth scenario is the current permit includes numeric effluent limitations for aquatic toxicity, but the most sensitive species is not seriodaphnia, it's another test species, 
And in this scenario, we would include the monthly, median, and maximum daily effluent limitations using the most sensitive species as currently required in the provision. So those are the four scenarios. They're written into the provisions and again, would become inoperable on December 31st, 2023. With that, I'm gonna go over some of the other notable changes uh, beyond our big ticket items we were wrestling with. Um, this is the list of them. I'm gonna go through each one, um, one by one. Uh, so I don't need to necessarily list them here. So starting with interaction of the toxicity provisions. This is at the very beginning and these follow the structure of the provisions if you're following along in the language of the provisions. Um, the October 2018 version identified the interactions of the toxicity provisions with the basin plans, as well as the state implementation policy or the SIP. Uh, this is a water quality control plan that's applicable statewide. And so we needed to describe how, what portions of the basin plans in the SIP would be um, superseded or not by the uh, new provisions in the ISWEBI. Oh, I said I wasn't going to say it again, but I did. Um, and then it also indicates the interaction of the toxicity provisions with narrative and numeric aquatic toxicity water quality objectives that currently exist in the basin plan. Um, so we made some clarifying language changes to make it clear that for non-stormwater MPDS dischargers only when the permitting authority includes numeric effluent limitations for toxicity, it can include, it cannot include any other numeric effluent limitations um, except for more protective TMDL based requirements. Um, so this is making it clear that, uh, that the regional boards the permitting authority can't include other numeric effluent limitations outside of what's um, provided in the um, toxicity provisions if they're using t uh, table one species with at the in-stream waste concentration. Um, we also clarified that the permitting authority can rely solely on the numeric aquatic toxicity water quality objectives to address non-chemical specific aquatic toxicity except when it would not fully protect all aquatic species in the relevant water body. So in other words, um, we encourage the permitting authority to use the table one species, but um, those are not the only species that can be used to ad address non-chemical specific aquatic toxicity. All right, moving on to the category of most sensitive species for acute toxicity. This will be a theme that will return to us when we get to the reasonable potential section here in a minute. Um, the October 2018 version allowed the permitting authority discretion as to whether they would conduct a, a sen species sensitivity screening uh, for acute toxicity for POTW dischargers, but that all other non-stormwater MPDS dischargers must conduct a species sensitivity screening. Uh, after receiving comments that, does this really make sense? What's the difference? Um, why would we uh, require it for non, other non-stormwater NPDS dischargers but allow discretion for POTWs? And after discussing it with the board and uh, thinking through why we would uh, have that difference, we decided it didn't make sense. And so we have made the change to provide discretion for all dischargers to determine when the, whether a species sensitivity screening for acute toxicity is required. And we clarified that chronic toxicity tests are, uh, and effluent limitations are generally more, uh, are protective of acute toxicity. Continuing with the theme of most sensitive species. Uh, for the initial species sensitivity screening for chronic toxicity, the October 2018 version uh, required all non-stormwater NPDS dischargers must conduct a species sensitivity screening either prior to or within 18 months of 
the first issuance, reissuance, renewal, or reopening of a permit after the effective date of the toxicity provision. Um, we have not changed that, although we have provided for uh, data that uh, from species sensitivity screening that has been generated within the 10 years prior to the effective date of the provisions can be used to determine the most sensitive species when certain data, when data meet certain conditions. So this allows for um, bringing in data that was previously um, uh, generated before the provisions were uh, adopted, assuming that they get adopted. Let's hope, my fingers are crossed. Again, sticking with most sensitive species, uh, any subsequent species sensitivity screening for chronic toxicity, um, the 2018 version uh, required no less than a species sensitivity screening to be conducted no less than once every 10 years, unless the discharger is participating in a regional monitoring program. After looking, uh, getting comments, as well as looking more closely at what the result of the proposed language was, uh, we determined that it's possible for a discharger to never conduct a species sensitivity screening again. Um, under the the language of the provisions. And so we've extended, our proposal now is to extend the amount of time from 10 to 15 years that the permitting authority may allow before requiring a new species sensitivity screening. So um, no more than 15 years. And then we remove the exception for dischargers who participate in a regional monitoring program and part of the rationale for that is that not all regional monitoring programs um, are the same. Uh, the requirements aren't the same. And so rather than giving a blanket exception, we've um, just extended the time between species sensitivity screening to 15 years um, that the regional board has the discretion to authorize. They do not have to allow that amount of time. Also, with the species sensitivity screening for non-continuous dischargers, the 2018 version uh, re required four sets of tests be completed within a one-year period, evenly distributed across the duration of the discharge season. So if it's a continuous discharge year-round, that would be roughly one screening per quarter. Uh, if it's not year round, it would be four sets of tests completed during whatever quarters um, are th the discharge occurs. Um, we have now made changes to allow seasonal and intermittent dischargers to use fewer than four sets of tests for the species sensitivity screening. Uh, I believe the provisions indicate that uh, a screening would need to be conducted in any quarter that the uh, discharger is discharging, um, but that any discharge, discharging more than 15 days, that is, but that if any dischargers do not uh, discharge more than 15 days in every quarter of the year, the permitting authority has the discretion to not require a species sensitivity screening at all. Um, again, with the most sensitive species, the next applicable species, the October 2018 version, uh, indicated that when the most sensitive species could not be used, such as when a discharger encounters unresolvable test interference or can't secure a reliable supply of test organisms or something out of uh, the control of the discharger, the executive director or executive officer may specify the next applicable species as the most sensitive species. We've tightened up that language to allow the permitting authority to specify in the permits that the executive officer or director can authorize the temporary use of the next applicable species as the most sensitive species under certain conditions. Again, that's if you can't get, there's a, I believe it's the inland silver side that in some portions of the year, it's difficult to get those test organisms. If they're not available, then um, the next most sensitive species can be used during that time period. But it has to be approved by the executive officer. 
All right, moving on out of most sensitive species and into reasonable potential. This is where acute toxicity uh, rears its head yet again um, and has the same rationale. The October 2018 version required reasonable potential analysis for all non stormwater, well, gave discretion to the permitting authority to conduct an RPA for acute toxicity for POTW dischargers but required a reasonable potential analysis for all other non-stormwater dischargers for acute toxicity. Um, and again, we looked at it, didn't, uh, we'll, were unable to technically justify the difference. And so now the provisions um, allow the permitting authority the discretion to determine when a reasonable potential analysis is required for acute toxicity. Moving on to the data to be used for reasonable potential, the October 2018 version required all toxicity test data generated within five years prior to permit issuance, reissuance, or renewal or reopening that is representative of the effluent quality during discharge conditions must be evaluated to determine reasonable potential. We haven't made any change to that requirement, but added. Um, uh, the requirement to reanalyze that that there may be a need to reanalyze toxicity test data or require additional toxicity tests to determine reasonable potential if the discharger has not conducted at least four toxicity tests at the in-stream waste concentration. So the idea here being that um, there the data may not be available to um, to conduct the reasonable potential analysis. And so uh, there may be a need to reanalyze the data using the TST in order to determine whether the thresholds for reasonable potential have been exceeded. All right, moving on to monitoring requirements and the issue of the calendar month. Um, the 2018 version provides for the permitting authority to specify the day and the month that the uh, that correspond to the start of the calendar month for purposes of assessing compliance with the maximum daily and the monthly median effluent limitation. The MMEL is the more important one here because as you uh, all know, the there may be need to conduct up to three uh, chronic toxicity tests in a calendar month. Um, sorry, my other phone is ringing. Um, within a calendar month to assess compliance with the MMEL. Um, we did a lot of investigating with laboratories and lots of discussions with a variety of stakeholders and came to the conclusion that we would not change the requirement but that we would allow the permitting authority to work with dischargers and laboratories to determine what the best date for the start of the calendar month would be um, based on uh, other monitoring that the discharger has to conduct as well as uh, whether laboratories have constraints like multiple clients uh, all having the same start of the calendar month may make it more difficult for them to conduct all of the tests necessary to assess compliance with the effluent limitation. So just providing some um, language that alerts the permitting authority that they need to be thinking about and discussing with dischargers and laboratories what the start of that calendar month ought to be for each discharger. And that would be established in the permit. Uh, monitoring frequency is also one that had we had a lot of discussions about. Um, you'll recall that the 2018 version required dischargers that discharge greater than 5 MGD must conduct monthly monitoring, and any that uh, discharge less than 5 MGD must conduct quarterly monitoring. We've um, retained the requirement for um, dischargers with effluent limitations that discharge greater than 5 MGD to conduct monthly monitoring, except for dischargers that discharge less than 1 MGD. So, dischargers between 1 and 5 must conduct 
uh, quarterly monitoring, and then dischargers less than one MGD must conduct biannual monitoring or two monitoring uh, tests per year. Um, and then non-stormwater MPDS dischargers that don't have effluent limitations would conduct at least two routine chronic aquatic toxicity tests per year. The rationale for that requirement was back when we had our workshop, I want to say in August of last year, there, there was some discussion about um, even with dischargers who don't have effluent limitations, the regional boards would require toxicity monitoring anyway. It serves as a backstop for uh, unknown toxicants that may be coming through the, the plant, as well as uh, generating data needed to issue a future permit and identify um, whether a discharger has reasonable potential in future permit cycles. So um, understanding that that would be the case and that even if you don't have reasonable potential, you'll have monitoring requirements. We wanted to make sure those monitoring requirements were, um, were consistent with how we require monitoring and conduct the testing um, for those dischargers who do have effluent limitations. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute as well. Um, but before I get there, I want to talk about the reduced monitoring frequency. So in the October 2018 version, the permitting authority could reduce a discharger's chronic toxicity routine monitoring if during the prior five consecutive years, certain conditions are met, including compliance with effluent limitations. We're not changing that, but because there are many dischargers who don't currently have effluent limitations, they wouldn't have data that could be used to justify a routine monitoring frequency in the first reissuance of their permit once the provisions get into place. And so what we've included now is the permitting authority has the discretion to reduce chronic toxicity monitoring frequency for dischargers whose previous permit didn't include chronic toxicity effluent limitations so long as certain conditions are met. So the data would be reanalyzed using the TST, um, it allows for reduced monitoring frequency for dischargers who have data that um, can be uh, used to justify it. A little bit more flexibility. Um, the next item is reduced monitoring frequency during a toxicity reduction evaluation. The October 2018 version allowed the permitting authority to grant a temporary reduced monitoring frequency of at least two chronic toxicity tests per year. The current version now um, allows the permitting authority to grant a reduced monitoring frequency down to two per year, so long as toxicity testing is being conducted as part of the TRE process, which is pretty typical. So, um, The next issue is with respect to replacement tests. So if a test fails uh, test acceptability criteria or isn't conducted uh, for some other reason, um, what does a discharger do? And in the October 2018 version, this issue was not included. Uh, although we did get a lot of comments about, um, well, what are we supposed to do when this occurs? So we decided to add some language to be clear as to what the permitting authority and the dischargers are supposed to do. So we now have language that requires the dischargers to conduct a replacement test as soon as possible when a routine monitoring test, a monthly median effluent target test or a monthly median effluent limitation compliance test is not completed um, and allows the discharger additional time to initiate required tests when the permitting authority determines that it wasn't initiated during the required time due to circumstances outside of the discharger's control that were not preventable. Um, so the examples I like to use are a laboratory receives some fathead minnows in a shipment and there's a hole in the 
the bag and all of the little minnows are dead and can't be used for a toxicity test. Um, so that's one example. And I'm sure there are others. Although we don't anticipate this being something that happens frequently, um, but wanted to make sure that there was language that allowed for the discretion to initiate new tests quickly, um, but not get a violation of your monitoring requirements if this um, situation occurs. All right, so I mentioned earlier effluent targets, and I have um, sprinkled that term around through this whole presentation a number of times. Again, this is included to make sure that anyone who has toxicity monitoring requirements but doesn't have effluent limitations is conducting their tests in a consistent manner with um, the provision. And so we've now included uh, monthly median effluent targets as well as month maximum daily effluent targets in the, um, in the provision. And they function basically the same for, as the effluent limitations. Um, but do not result in violations, but could result in the requirement to conduct a toxicity reduction evaluation. And I probably already said all this stuff in this slide. I preempted myself. No violations and a TRE is required. Yes, I did basically say everything in this slide already. Finally, uh, exemptions. Uh, the October 2018 version uh, allowed the permitting authority to exempt dischargers serving small disadvantaged communities from some or all of the toxicity provisions, so long as the permitting authority could make the finding that the discharge will have no reasonable potential to cause or contribute to an exceedance of the toxicity water quality objectives. Um, we have since, uh, after receiving comments and discussions, uh, have removed the exemption for, for POTW serving small disadvantaged communities um, for two reasons. First is that uh, rather than exempting them from toxicity requirements, we should be um, assisting them with getting into compliance with toxicity requirements. And then some of these small disadvantaged communities may be able to be exempted under the insignificant discharge exemption. Um, depending on the quality of their discharge and their circumstances. Um, however, we did add exemptions for three, uh, for three categories of dischargers for whom we ha have statewide NPDS permits already issued to cover their discharge. That would be for biological pesticide and residual pesticide dischargers. So uh, discharges associated with uh, um, uh, spraying vector control pesticides, for example. Also drinking water system discharges whose biggest uh, chemical of concern is uh, chlorine and there are requirements in their current permit that are designed to, to um, mitigate the toxicity associated with chlorine discharge and similarly the natural gas facilities have the same issue. All right, with that, I will go over the project timeline moving forward. Um, after today, the public comment period uh, continues until 12 noon on August 24th, 2020. Um, I'm about to sneeze, I think, <laughs> maybe, we'll see. Um, then uh, our plan is to receive comments uh, and begin and prepare a response to those comments and uh, release, you know, obviously conduct additional stakeholder meetings as appropriate um, uh, or requested uh, and propose a final draft of the provisions and release that sometime in the fall. Um, revise the provisions and staff report and release those along with a response to the 2020 comments. And then, uh, and we would be making, releasing those documents at least 30 days prior to um, a meeting at which we propose the board to consider adoption of the final draft 
provisions. These are the contacts, Zane Poulsen, who you met at the beginning of the presentation, as well as Rebecca Fitzgerald. And then this is also the link for the documents and additional information. And with that, we're going to open uh, the mics up for questions and comments. Um, and so uh, let's see, Jacob, would you like to, maybe I'll just say, if you uh, have comments, questions, please use the function to raise your hand. If you open the participant list in the Zoom platform, you will have the option to raise your hand and we will be seeing you at the top of our participant list and we'll be going um, from the top to the bottom. And I see Josh Westfall currently has his hand up. And so I am going to unmute you, Josh, and I'm going to allow you, you can share your video, I think. Hold on, yes, you can. There you go. Okay. Thank you, it's working. Um, two questions, comments. Uh, first one is probably relatively easy. Um, when we're when in the provisions, the updated provisions in the section on the in-stream waste concentration, um, this may be an area where it would be helpful to um, just throw some ex an example out there. And this is similar to what was done for the acute, but uh, under the section that says that the permitting authority shall specify the IWC, um, this might be a, just a space to clean it up to say that, you know, we wouldn't expect the IWC to change except under, you know, certain situations. Uh, but just a little bit of guidance there might be helpful. Uh, and then the second question slash comment, and I, I know that a lot of folks in the regulate community have some concern with this, uh, specifically dealing with the C. dubious study that's planned. Um, it, this is another place where it would be nice if there was some language included about uh, the board check-in that was, that was discussed when we first went over the study as opposed to an automatic, an, automatically taking effect of the provisions on December 31st, 2023. And that's all I have. Thank you. So just quickly uh, regarding the Sarah Daphnia study, our intent was to include such language in the resolution and not the provisions themselves. And I'm sorry, I didn't catch whether the first comment Elizabeth looks like she's got something to say on the first comment. Thank you. Hi, Karen. Um, it wasn't on the first comment, it was more on the second one. Just wanted to clarify oh, okay. that um, the resolution might include language um, discussing a possible check-in, um, but the provisions itself does have that automatic um, switch for the effluent limits, and that wouldn't be based on a uh, future board action, it would um, be automatic based on the time period. Thank you. Okay, Josh is muted again. So next up is Cam Irvin. I'm gonna unmute, oh. I need to stop doing that. I think Jake is doing it. So I'm going to I'm going to keep my hands off of the controls. <laughs> Good afternoon, you Cam. You're, yes. Great. Well, well, thank you and, and your staff. I uh, appreciate you going through these uh, changes with us. Um, so I have a question or comment. It's um, about an issue we've discussed before in the fall um, related and I guess it starts with um, a change that was made to the definition or the inclusion of a, a test completion. Um, section IVB2D says that for the purpose of the section, completion of a test means that when a test has been terminated and all required test conditions and TAC or test requirements have been, sorry, and TAC have been met. So we talked about this in the fall and um, I guess I, this, this still creates conflict for me. And um, um, 
at least there's potential for conflict, if not actual conflict, between the toxicity provisions, the EPA test guidance, and the TST guidance um, by specifying test conditions and tax. So I guess maybe I could ask you what, um, what was meant by test conditions, and if that's exclusively the test conditions described in the tables of the EPA test guidance. Yes, that's what it's referring to. Okay. So if so, then like the conflict is that there are other test requirements. Um, TAC, test acceptability criteria are one. Um, the test conditions are really the test procedures, like how many replicates, age of the test organisms, um, things like that. And so, sure, you don't have a valid test if, if you don't follow those. Um, the TST guidance from EPA 2010 says, once a test has been conducted um, using multiple effluent con concentrations and other requirements as specified in the wet test method, then the TST approach can be used to analyze valid wet test results or to assess whether the effluent discharge is toxic. So even the, the TST guidance is, has a really simple definition by just saying um, test requirements. And so I guess I would, I would really um, think this would be helpful if it said, all test requirements rather than specifying test conditions in TAC. Okay, well, we can look into that. I encourage you to submit those comments. Did you have other questions? I do have a couple more. Do you want me to, to move to go on or should I open up the floor so others can have a chance? You might as well, you have the floor, so you might as well finish your comments and then we'll move on to the next commenter. All right, well, that was probably my biggest concern. Um, the other, or my second comment is about replacement tests. Um, you mentioned that as your change number 16. So we appreciate the flexibility um, that's presented in the revised provisions um, to conduct a retest uh, and to do that as soon as possible, I guess, if, if that goes into the next calendar month, though, it does create the possibility that that four tests need to be completed in that next calendar month. Um, and we've had discussions and submitted comments about how three tests is going to be a significant challenge for many dischargers due to scheduling and other, other situations. So, so adding a fourth test is, is definitely problematic. Um, but there is a change um, that might be helpful because you wouldn't have to necessarily do four separate tests if staff would delete the final sentence in I think the first paragraph of ivb 2 d 4 which states that the new toxicity test shall not be used to substitute for any other required toxicity tests. And the reason why I guess I'm making this comment is because if, if a test is, um, if there's a retest needed because of some reason and it goes into the next calendar month, um, then that sentence says that you cannot use that test to determine compliance for the month that it was the samples were collected. Um, and instead you have to do that test, you have to do your routine compliance test if you're doing monthlies, and then you might have to do two MMEL or MMET tests. Um, so is there a reason why you can't use that test for compliance in the month that the samples were collected? Yeah, so the rationale there is that we wouldn't want a single sample to and a single toxicity test to be used to assess compliance and cause two separate violations. That's the, the, the rationale that we used to, to include that. But I also encourage you to, to submit those comments. Okay, sure. And did you have others? I do, sorry for dominating, but I'll, I'll yield soon. Um, there's a, Let's see, the section on chronic aquatic toxicity effluent limits, IVD2EI. Um, I'm asking, I, I'd like you, I was wondering if you could explain what is meant by the new text that says, to the extent that any monitoring requires the use of receiving water, different species, different effluent concentrations, IWC, or different test methods, the monitoring cannot be used to determine compliance with the chronic toxicity effluent limitations specified in this section. Is there a simple way to say that so I can understand better? What 
Maybe I'll turn that one to Elizabeth. I think I know the answer, but I want to make sure it's correct. I know I do know the answer, but <laughs> sorry, I was just trying to find the exact language, Cameron, that you're referring to. So um, you said it was in the flood limitation section. Do you mind uh, repeating it one more time? Sure. I, I, my notes say the end of the second paragraph, IVB to EI. Um, to the extent any monitoring requires the use of receiving water, different species, different effluent concentrations than the IWC, or different test methods, that monitoring cannot be used to determine compliance with the chronic aquatic toxicity effluent limitations specified in this section. That's because in the fluent limitation section, we specify specifically that the most sensitive species will be used to determine compliance, as well as uh, testing conducted at the IWC. So that was trying to clarify if you're using something outside of those, um, uh, that testing, then um, that's not gonna be used for determination of the fluent limit. Okay, and that's good. So additional testing, which may be required, would not be used to determine Compliance with the FLM. Okay, thanks. That's that's good. Um, one more. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is regarding toxicity reductions. Which are, sorry, toxicity reduction evaluations. Um, section IVB to H at the end of the first paragraph says that um, a TRE may also be required when there's no effluent available to complete a routine monitoring test, MET test, or MMEL compliant test. So. I guess I'm wondering how might a TRE be required if there's no effluent available to conduct TRE? Sorry, I'm gonna look that language up. I know it's hard to find all these things. Um, IVB. What page is it on? H. Page would be helpful to start with. <laughs> <laughs> I have a clean version of the. Oh. Oh, okay. Page 31. 38, I believe. Yeah, I see it now. It's the end of the first paragraph. So, so it, this, the context there is the sentence before that, which is, in addition, if other information indicates, so for example, results of additional monitoring, results of monitoring at other higher concentrations in the IWC, fish kills, intermittent recurring toxicity, then the permitting authority may require a TRE. And a TRE may be required even when there is no effluent available to complete a routine monitoring test. So in other words, if there's other evidence to suggest that the effluent is um, causing toxicity, a toxicity reduction evaluation, which does not always have to include toxicity testing, needs to may still be required. So out of context, it's, um, it doesn't make sense, but with the rest of that context, knowing that you can use other information to um, look into uh, and, and figure out what could be causing other ancillary toxicity issues, um, a TRE may be required. Okay, I assume there'd be a case-by-case -case discussion of this. And I, I can understand how maybe just a source evaluation could be done um, when you're not discharging consistently consistently, but maybe there was toxicity at a time. Okay, um, I'm gonna yield for now. I might have some follow-ups, but I will definitely like to hear what other people say. So thank you. All right, thanks. Next, it looks like we have Caitlin Kalua. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Caitlin, California Coast Keeper Alliance. Um, had a couple of other questions, but I'll start with C. Dubia just to um, continue for continuity of the last question, because I think my question is a little similar. Um, and let's see, well, I'm curious, um, is just understanding a little more of the rationale as to why in a TRE, let's see, I'm looking at scenario one and scenario three, where there's this new target that would essentially serve as a trigger for a TRE if a toxicity violation is detected or if there's, um, you know, presence of toxicity. And I just was curious as far as what other information, what would be a case where a TRE would not be initiated? Because I know the language does say may. And I just remembering from conversations last, um, 
October and August that the idea was, you know, we understand maybe there may not be a limit for these scenarios one and three, or sorry, maybe it's not three. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at the change sheet. Um, but for those scenarios, but that we do want a TRE, you know, conducted so we can actually identify the source of toxicity and essentially have it resolved. So my long winded question <laughs> is just understanding in what circumstances might not, why, might a TRE not be done and why? Okay, so the requirement to conduct a TRE remains the same whether you have a target or an effluent limitation. So, and if you look at the top of that paragraph, a TRE is required when you have any combination of two or more MDEL or MMEL violations within a calendar month or within two successive calendar months. And it goes on to talk, say the same thing about effluent targets, maximum daily and monthly median effluent targets. So the threshold is two violations or exceedances of targets. Uh, either within a month or in, in consecutive months, you have to conduct a TRE. Um, so that hasn't changed. And with the seriodapnea scenarios, it would remain the same as well if a target is included in a permit rather than a limitation during the interim period. Does that make sense? It does, and that's really helpful. I may have been reading too much into the word may, so I appreciate that. Sure. Um, staying on the topic of C. dubia, and I promise to move on, <laughs> is um, just curious to know more about the inoperable date of December 31st, 2023, and that just trying to understand what that exactly means. I understand that these scenarios will apply until 2023, um, essentially if a permit is reissued, reopened, et cetera, before that date. But then what essentially happens, let's say you have a permit that's issued, you know, December 1st of 2023, um, will then those scenarios still take effect for the term of the permit or does those scenarios essentially expire? So Elizabeth, I'm gonna let you correct me where I'm wrong. But the way that we have talked about it is that the permit has to include the effluent limitations that would be required if those scenarios didn't exist. And that if the permit extends beyond December of 2023, the portions of the permit that are responsive to those scenarios would no longer be operable either. And the the discharger would then go back to having effluent limitations or whatever would have been required. Um, I'm not seeing Elizabeth get on the video. Oh, there she is. I knew she would correct me. So please correct um, where I have misspoke. Um, I didn't get on because I think you, you got that correct. There is language in the section identifying that the permitting authority shall indicate, you know, the, the effluent limit slash target that's in effect until December 31st, 2023, and then also indicate that starting December 31st, 2023, that they need to comply with the MDL and MMEL in the provisions. So it would already be in the permit um, laid out if it was reissued issued before the 2023 date. It's really helpful, thank you. Um, let's. See, I'm just double checking my questions here while I have the floor. Um, I Okay, last CDBA question actually, it's very similar. Um, just curious for those that have a current permit and that, you know, that for dischargers that fall under that scenario three where they already have numeric um, effluent limitations, they already have CDBA listed as their, or identified as their most sensitive species. Are they, is there then the opportunity um, to request a reopening of the permit prior to December 31st, 2023 in order to have that second bulleted option apply? Or um, is that this only applies to those that are, you know, kind of expiring before 2023 and are then reissued and renewed? Well, I'm going to say that I think that um, there are some facilities who will request a 
update to their permit based on the provisions um, prior to expiration of their permit, I think. Um, so I, I'm not going to say that that's a scenario that cannot happen. Um, but I think generally speaking, you know, the regional boards don't have extra time on their hands to just turn their attention to permits that aren't necessarily expired or on their docket to reissue. So functionally, I think it's going to be any permit that is expired and ready to be reissued would be subject to those potential scenarios. That's helpful. I appreciate that. Um, and then away from CWA, just curious to understand a little more of the rationale um, under the monitoring frequency. There was the reduced monitoring, or sorry, the monitoring frequency required for those POTWs between, or non stormwater um, NPDES discharges between one and five uh, million gallons daily that they are then to conduct by annual monitoring. Um, I just was curious to learn more about that rationale. I know this was a topic of discussion at previous um, workshops, but I just think was between curious. one and five, I think that between one and five, it's quarterly. Zane, correct me. Yeah, I, I just had to unmute myself. Correct. The 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 yeah. biannual is for those who are less than one MGD. That we um, they start out now at biannual, and um, and go ahead. I was going to say, and then mm -hmm. if they do have issues, that there's um, you know toxicity in their effluent, then the regional boards can move them up to quarterly. Thank you. That's what I was just going to say too. That's really helpful. So I, I may have misread the um, slide or you know heard it opposite. So I appreciate that. Um, no worry. And then my last question. I'm just curious to know a little more about what would qualify as a non-chemical specific toxicity. Um, just trying to understand. You know, if, is there an example of this? Yeah, just toxicity testing that you can't identify the chemical at the you know toxicity that you identify with a toxicity test doesn't automatically show you what the toxicant is. And so um, without doing a TIE or some other investigation to figure out what the toxicant is, then it's a non-chemical uh, toxicity event until you figure out what the chemical is. Does that make sense? It does, and no, I appreciate that. All right, I am seating the floor. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. All right, next we have Paul Bedore. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, Karen and staff. Hi. Good to see you on video. It'll be better in person. Make sure you introduce yourself and yeah, who sure. you are representing. I'm Paul Bedore. I'm with Roberts and Bryan Incorporated, where uh, RBI is representing a handful of Central Valley wastewater treatment utilities, including Roseville, Colorado Irrigation District, Stockton, and others. I have a few questions. Uh, the first is we reviewed and saw the changes to um, what POTWs were required to automatically be issued effluent limits. So that was the addition for the, uh, the qualification that they had to be required to have a pretreatment program. So I went through some of the permits of some of the clients that are funding our efforts, like the city of Brentwood, <clears throat> who doesn't have any industrial, significant industrial users. They're actually required in their permit to have a pretreatment program. And the reason for that is because the California code of regulations are more stringent than the federal code and they require, regardless of if they're SIUs, uh, that uh, POTWs at five MGD or greater have a pretreatment program. So uh, at this point in time, it doesn't look like even though it, you know, you, you've got the clear intent to make some changes here, uh, at least the changes won't result in any uh, you know, effective changes when it comes to rollout policy. Out of curiosity, did you look at their data to see if they would have reasonable potential based on the thresholds anyway? Uh, no, I was just checking on, uh, on the regulations primarily related to the pretreatment program because that was the that that's what undergirds the this uh, this stipulation of whether or not folks would have to uh, automatically get an effluent limit. Sure. So uh, you got the intent there, but uh, at least here in California, we're a little more stringent than the, the feds. Um, 
The other comment I had was with regards to uh, using the permitted flow to trigger the 5 MGD threshold um, versus uh, actual dry weather flows because there's an incentive to POTWs to limit their flows to receiving waters in order to uh, use Title 22 recycled water. And so uh, just the idea and some of the comments we, we put in were related to using uh, the actual flow rates rather than the permitted flow rates. Uh, you know, regional board staff are used to, to looking at both of those when they're assessing various things, including dilution. And so is there, um, you know, what was the rationale for not making the move to let the regional water boards, you know, assess this threshold based upon uh, actual flow rates in order to incentivize dischargers to utilize as much recycled water as possible and to get their flows below the threshold. So you would think that this would be cut and dried and easy, but it is not. We have done a lot of investigating into permit language and it is not clear what, uh, what is the most relevant and useful piece of information for a statewide plan to apply flow thresholds for various requirements. And so um, even what we have included here isn't necessarily consistent with all of the permits that are have been issued. So we had to pick something that would be clear cut and um, that the permitting authority could use. Uh, actual flows are also quite variable. And so what, uh, what to pick is not clear either if you are trying to use quote unquote actual flows. And Zane has got his video on, so I'm gonna let him augment my answer. Thank you. Yeah, so we, you know, we looked at this quite a bit, as Karen was saying, to figure out you know, which one to use. And we talked a lot to our permitting staff about what should be used. And you know, Elizabeth can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we have a very, we don't specify exactly what has to be used. We provide some suggestions to the uh, regional boards, and we say basically that it should not be less. So it's it's based on the term that we use is authorized rate of discharge, but then defining that it's very difficult because that's not a term that's used in permits. It's used in, I think, some federal language, but it's just difficult to say. Okay, well, what is that? And yeah. so we say that it shouldn't be less than your average dry weather flow, but that okay. should. But that's the direction to the regional boards. But we don't have a something that specifies you shall not have it less. So it's really up to the regional boards to decide what that um, authorized rate of discharge actually is. Okay, well that that's helpful. I'll take a closer look at that. I appreciate the feedback. Uh, and I, I do have another comment. So there was a, the board hearing in October um, where a number of us gave comments and so forth. And you had a presentation, Karen, and uh, so. The comments that were put forward at that time, are they included in the response to comments? Uh, yes. Because that wasn't clear to me. Okay. All right, that's, uh, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you. Great, thank you, Paul. Uh -huh. Next, we have Ann Heil. Hi, I have a couple of different questions. Um, so I will start with the first one, and this relates to language on page 34 of the policy. Oh, and it, thank you for pointing us to a page. <laughs> and it also was covered on your slide 12. And this has okay. to do with the situation where you are a non-stormwater NPDES discharger that currently has numeric effluent limit in your permit for Seriodaphnia uh, is your most sensitive species. So the permitting authority shall include one option or the other, um, either the MDEL and, and anyway, I won't go through. But you have the two options as to what you can do in that situation. Um, who mm -hmm. choose which option? Does the discharger get to choose that or the permitting authority? Um, the permitting authority shall include one or the other. Um, we're assuming that that's going to be a conversation that they have with the discharger prior to including one or the other. Um, but we definitely had to identify the permitting authority as the ultimate decision maker in the provisions. Okay, 
So the permitting authority decides. Correct. And I'll just interrupt, Anne, can you um, identify who you're representing to? Oh, oh yes, thank you. Anne Hyland with the Los Angeles County Sanitation District. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. All right, uh, sorry about that. Okay, the um, second question relates to language on page five. And page five talks about the interaction of the toxicity provisions with the narrative and generic um, toxicity water quality objectives. Um, and I think you talked about this in slide 15 as well. So your slide 15 said, okay, so if you have an NPDES permit with a numeric aquatic toxicity receiving water limit, um, then the limit has to be done using basically the stuff in the policy, um, except if you've got a more protective team. Then above that, you've got this language that the permitting authority may rely on the numeric aquatic toxicity water quality objectives in section 3B2 to address non-chemical specific aquatic toxicity um, unless there's information to suggest that the numeric aquatic toxicity water quality objective would not fully protect all aquatic species. So I think you said on slide 15 that if you've got a limit for, let's say, fathead minnows, um, then you can't put in a limit for, for an NPDES permit, then you can't put in a limit for some other species. Um, is that right? I'm, I'm trying to think about in the case, let's say, where you want to do Hylella, um, even though you go through, you, you do your invertebrates, fathead minnows are your most sensitive species, you get a numeric limit for that. What happens if the regional board wants to regulate another species as well? Can they? I'm gonna punt this one to Elizabeth. I think I know the answer, but I don't wanna say the wrong thing. Sorry, right when I, I muted myself, I closed the provisions. So give me one second. Yeah, this is page five, kind of the second and third well, from the bottom. That's why I printed mine out. <laughs> <laughs> so um, following that last, the last paragraph in that section, it specifies for non-stormwater NPS dischargers. So if you're a non-stormwater NPS discharger and the permitting authority chooses to put an effluent limit, <clears throat> excuse me, in accordance with, you know, our, our section, which is related to table one species, um, that they should only include that effluent limit um, and not another, um, unless there's a TMDL-based uh, reason for, for applying a, a different non-table one species. Okay, so to answer my question, then if, if you have fathead minnow as your most sensitive species, they can't give you a high allele limit for a non-stormwater NPDES discharger, unless there's some sort of TMDL that would require it. I want to say yes, but I, I don't have table one in front of me, so Karen might be more familiar. Th both of those are um, acute test methods, correct? So we're talking about acute and acute, not chronic and acute? Uh, well, I was thinking chronic, chronic, but... Okay, chronic, chronic, that, then yes, that's right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, Hyalella is not a chronic species. Oh, it's not, okay. Well, you can pick another. Yeah. But, but you're right, it, yeah, pick a different species that's also a chronic species and no, you would not have two different effluent limitations using two different species. The effluent limitations are based on the most sensitive species identified in the permit at the in-stream waste concentration. Okay, and that's for the NPDES dischargers, so if you have someone under WDRs, well, first of all, how would this, let's just back up a little bit. How would this whole policy apply to WDR dischargers that are not NPDES dischargers? It wouldn't. Okay. Because this is discharged to surface water and focused on non-stormwater. At least the implementation portion is focused on non-stormwater NPDES dischargers. Now, the water quality objectives will apply in ambient waters where 
somebody may be uh, under a waste discharge requirement for a non point source type of a discharge like irrigated lands, for example. Um, and the, the water quality objectives would apply under those programs, um, depending on how the permit is structured, but we don't have implementation language that's specific to those other than that you have to use the TST if you're already required to conduct toxicity monitoring. Okay, so if I've got a plant discharging to a water body that's not a water of the US, then that's that right. permit is gonna have to use the TST, but the implementation provisions would not apply. Well, a water of the state. Water of well, the state. Well, no, you're right. The water of the U.S. An NPDES discharge is a water of the U.S. Sorry, I misspoke. So you may you're have correct. a discharge to a water of the state. It's not a water of the U.S. That's correct. Okay. So I guess I just would add to that um, a water of the state that is also a, a water of the state that's not a water of the U.S. That's also a surface water. Yes. Um, then our water quality objectives would apply still to those water bodies. And like Karen said, our implementation section doesn't have specific requirements um, that must be implemented by the permitting authority. So it would be up to the regional board um, to determine which effluent limit, if any, is appropriate for that permit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, and then I want to circle back um, over to page, not circle back, but anyway, go to page 14, and this has to do with the mixing and dilution. And Josh brought mm -hmm. this up, but I think he went a little fast, and I'm not sure his question really got through. So I'm just going to do it one more time and go a little more slowly than Josh did. So we're on the in-stream waste concentration language on page 14, right in the middle. And um, one, two, the third paragraph down under the in-stream waste concentration section. So it basically says, if you've got a mixing credit, you calculate it a certain way. And then there's language that says, unless the permitting authority selects a higher concentration of effluent as the IWC in order to protect beneficial uses or because of site specific conditions or both. So do you have any examples of that? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, region two okay. has many dischargers that have a huge amount of dilution. And so they choose to include um, requirements to conduct um, the testing at higher concentrations of effluent so that they can see a signal of toxicity and respond to it. Um, and so uh, that is one example of um, where this might apply. Um, although I don't think that they could set the in-stream waste concentration at that higher concentration. So they could assess the data there um, and do some response, but the effluent limitation, correct me if I'm wrong, Elizabeth, would not apply um, at that higher concentration. Um, in this instance, if, um, I, I can't think of any examples of ones that aren't um, just for that express purpose of trying to increase the signal. Zane, do you have an example? Well, you had region two, for example, for the Bay, um, they do a 10 to one dilution and they don't go beyond that. So rather than calculate it the way that we have here with their, the maximum amount of dilution, they're, they're basically in setting the in-stream waste concentration, they're setting the, that at a, um, higher concentration of, of effluent than they could uh, potentially if they followed, you know, did the, the, the full calculation. So I think that's an example that the, basically what I think this is saying, and those of you can correct me, they don't have to give the discharger the maximum amount of dilution available when they set the in-stream waste concentration. They can, they can give them only partial amount of the dilution that's, that's potentially available when they set that. Yeah, and I'm kind of wondering because, um, you know, this, this wouldn't apply to our agency for discharges to freshwater, but we always have our eye on our ocean dischargers as well. So sometimes your ocean dischargers are going to have very high dilution. Um, now, the language as written here is saying that you have to, um, um, you would have to have a reason that you needed to protect beneficial uses or because of site specific conditions. So it sounds like you'd have to provide some justification as to why you would want to take away that dilution or reduce the dilution credit. 
Yes. Okay, so if they just said, ah, we, did, we want 10 to one, they would, they would have to provide some sort of justification as to why they needed that in order to be protected. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, then I guess I wanted to move on to my last issue, which has to do with the, um, the, the drop dead date of December 31st, 2023. So in that case, um, it sounds like the plan right now is to put language in the adopting resolution that would provide for a board check-in before that date? Yes. Okay. So, so um, in, if the study turns up a lot of problems with this area Daphnia method, and I don't want to presuppose any outcome or anything, but if you really get a horrendous, um, some really terrible results out of it, and the board says, oh, whoa, we just aren't comfortable at all with, with having these limits take effect now. It's my understanding that it would probably take at least a year to amend the policy to change that once you went through like noticing something, putting together documents, probably more than a year um, if they wanted to, to make a change. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, a, it's quite a process to go through and make a change to a water quality control plan for sure. Okay. I, I, and timing wise, it's all over the map. It depends. We think certain things are simple, but they become not so simple very quickly. Oh, and yeah, and I mean, it, it often is the case where if something gets approved, it still might take a year before it goes to Office of Administrative Law and over to EPA and gets full approval and, and whatnot. And in my experience, those can be rather lengthy processes. Um, is there any way to write the policy such that there is some sort of out if the board objects to, you know, or the board, um, has serious questions about the method after looking at the study results? Uh, I'm going to kick that to our OCC friends, our attorney. I'm going to, I'm going to surmise that no, that it, there is no way to just say, uh, if without a public process, to make a change to the provisions, I don't think that we have sort of the ability to have contingent language, but I could be wrong. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure what that contingent language would be. Um, you're welcome to propose that in a, a comment letter um, and we can bring it before the board and see what their thoughts are on that. Okay, thanks. Um, that was what I had. Thanks very much for, for putting on the workshop and for um, giving me time to go through these questions. Oh, thank you, Anne. Um, Phil, you have unmuted yourself. Did you wanna chime in at all on that question? Yeah, I was just gonna offer to Anne if she wanted to, um, we, could, we could talk offline. I'm a little unclear exactly what she would be proposing also, so. Um, okay it's not impossible for us to draft basin plan amendments or water quality control plan amendments that are contingent, but um, I think it would have, like, like Elizabeth said, we'd have to have a much better idea of what exactly we're proposing. Okay, great, thank great. you. Thanks. All right, we have one more person with their hand up. Um, just know, I'm gonna just stop before we unmute Nicholas Blair from Aqua. Um, that if you are listening and you're on the Zoom platform and want to make a comment, please raise your hand. Also, if you're watching from the webcast, you are welcome to email questions to the email address that's at the bottom of the screen. Um, so with that, Nicholas Blair, you have been unmuted. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, so I also submitted a question online just in case I didn't uh, have time, but uh, Auk was curious to know the, and I'm, I'm referencing page 33 under the exemptions for drinking water uh, system discharges. So Auk was curious to know the rationale for why the, the board did not accept the edit we proposed from 2018 and 19. Um, simply put, uh, in the section, uh, the release that uses makes instead of has made and we're curious to know if there's a reason that uh, the board made use of makes instead of has made and 
what implications that has for uh, perpetuity. And, and I'll my, also just, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just, my page 33 does not match, I don't think, with. Okay, so. so you're, you're looking at the exemptions for drinking water dischargers? Here we go. Yes. I found it. It's on yeah. my page 41. Ah, I see. Um, I, I'll also just note that uh, we, in the past, have collaborated with the California Municipal Utilities Association, CMUA, and they also uh, have the same question on this. So but both of us are curious if there was a reasoning for using makes instead of has made and uh, how it, uh, what it means for perpetuity. So in other words, um, you interpret the term makes a finding that it is something that will happen in the future rather than yeah. the fact that those permits are already in place and the finding has already been made is that right, the distinction right. you're trying to make okay yeah. um i'm not sure if that was an intentional uh change um i don't recall us having the discussion on our team about that specifically so we'll just make a note of it but please include that in your um in your comments elizabeth is on so i'll let her make a comment as well yeah w one thing to clarify also is that um those findings have not been made yet because um it's you know our numeric toxicity objectives have not yet been adopted so there are no findings currently saying that there's no reasonable potential to exceed those objectives um and i i think that we'll explore um, further this discussion, but the um, intent was to um, have the permitting authority make that finding in each uh, permit renewal or reissuance. Um, and so not that it would be just one moment in time where they had no reasonable potential means that um, you're exempt for all, you know, all time in the future. It's the permitting authority has to consciously make that decision each uh, permit term. Well, and that actually brings up another good point that I'll add, which is the provisions and the implementation um, portion of them do not become effective in your permit upon the provisions becoming effective. They become effective when they get inserted in your permit after the provisions become effective. So in other words, um, the makes a finding is appropriate because as Elizabeth said, the current permit won't have the requirements or have made a finding based on the provisions yet. But it's not as if these provisions are going to go into effect in your current permit is kind of my point that I'm trying to make. So makes a finding makes more sense. Okay, uh, th thank you for that. We, we also plan on submitting uh, written comments and uh, we have a meeting set up with staff later. So looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Was that all you had? Yes. Oh, great. All right, thanks. Um, Cam, you have your hand up again. Hey, um, actually I don't have another comment, but I wanted to apologize for, I guess I committed the faux pas of not introducing myself when I made my early. Oh. So I am Cameron <laughs> Robertson Brining. And the comments that I made uh, were on behalf of several POTWs, Regional San, um, the cities of Stockton, Roseville, Brentwood, Lodi, Turlock, Atwater, and the El Dorado Irrigation District. Um, I also submitted some comments via email earlier, just in case I, there wasn't an opportunity to ask or if you guys were gonna put them into certain order. Um, those have been addressed uh, by the discussion, and so we don't need to bring those up if anybody was keeping track. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Paul, your hand is up. Yes, I'm back on behalf of everybody I said before, including those that can reference. Um, I, I just have a clarifying question. You brought this up, Karen, in your discussion on page 22 of the provisions. This is with regards to reduced monitoring. There mm -hmm. was additions made here. There's a section that says, if the permit includes the MDEL and MMEL, and then below that is a new section, if an NPDES permit does not include the MDEL and MMEL. So 
does that mean that those that have not triggered RP and that are monitoring pursuant to the triggers? Is that what the second section references? I'm sorry, my pages aren't the same as yours, so I'm not looking at the language. Okay. Um, but the, the issue is that to, in the 2018 version, in order to be able to authorize a reduced monitoring frequency, you would have had to have effluent limitations to demonstrate that you've not violated effluent limitations. And so the first permit issued after the provisions go into place, if no effluent limitations were, were uh, in that prior permit, then a permittee would not have the ability to demonstrate that they could have a reduced monitoring frequency. And so the distinction there is that if there's no effluent limitations in the current permit, the permitting authority has the ability to look at data that had been generated during that permit term in other ways other than uh, compliance with effluent limitations to be able to reduce the monitoring frequency at that first permit reissuance. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so it'd just be in the case. I'm hoping that I'm, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I think I'll, I'll try to, uh summarize what you're saying to make sure it's clear. So you're saying that to reduce monitoring, you have to have evaluated compliance relative to an effluent limit because those monitoring requirements of the monthly, quarterly, biannual stem from having been issued an effluent limit. And in the event that you have not been issued an effluent limit, you haven't demonstrated compliance with that. So um, yeah, it, it was a little confusing to, is, is that clear? Is that accurate? that you provided a second set of criteria for the instance where a permit has not yet had effluent limits. That's correct. Okay, so I guess the question is, if the discharger has collected data in the, the past that's sufficient to, uh, I guess, kind of backwards looking, look at whether or not they would have exceeded an an M MDEL or MMEL, um, why a different set of criteria? Um, I, I would find it really hard to believe. Well, Dane, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say that we looked at that and considered that, but the, the issue with that is that the current permits as they go that don't have effluent limitations, they don't do MMEL compliance tests. So if you have a fail, you don't have the follow-up tests to be able to, they just don't exist in order to do that. You, they have this accelerated monitoring in some cases, mm -hmm. but, it, but it's not the same. And so there's no way to show an equivalent um, whether or not they would have or wouldn't have had a, a violation. And so this is the best we could do. And it was, it was language that was actually suggested by um, some of the POTW dischargers came to us with this and asked us to include this. And we did that allows them to at least do it based on whether or not they have fails of, the, uh, of their triggers. Yeah, and it looked like it only then applied um, to those that, that could test at a higher IWC, um, or maybe I'm getting that wrong. And um, sorry, I, I'm I'm mixing this up with another section. I appreciate that, and I'll I'll end it there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul and um, Debbie Webster. You have your hand up. Sure. We have unmuted thank you. you. Thanks. Uh, is this Debbie Webster? I'm with the Central Valley Clean Water Association. I do actually have two follow-up questions on two of the comments that just uh, that we were talking about. So, um, what was new with this this uh, version was adding triggers. And I guess the question that I I'm going to in responding to what Zane said, how with 
are, are first of all, are the if you've got triggers, are you having the same monitoring frequency that you would have if you had limits? No, not necessarily. The and they're not trigger. We call them targets. Targets. Um, yes. Sorry. Um, just semantics. We struggled with what to call uh, exceeding a trigger, and you know, at any rate. Um, the target, the requirement is uh, two tests per year. So the minimum amount of monitoring that we require, even the smaller dischargers. But it can be increased with uh, the permitting authority can require more than that, but the minimum is two. So, so the smallest POTWs then would have targets and or absolute limits at the minimum frequency, the same minimum frequency? Unless they could be uh, determined to be an insignificant discharger with no reasonable potential to cause or contribute to exceedance of a water quality objective, in which case they would be exempt from some or all of the provisions and may not be required to monitor at all. Okay. Um, Is I, I know that at the last workshop, um, the State Water Board, at least for the smallest one, um, smallest of those, said come up with the bare minimum level. Um, this the the two per year is still much higher than most of the smallest agencies have to monitor. Is there a reason, or can you give the justification for why two as a minimum level was chosen? Uh, to characterize discharge over uh, a year, um, I know that there are some dischargers with one uh, one sampling per permit term, and just from a technical point of view, I can't see how that demonstrates or doesn't demonstrate whether there's toxicity in the effluent over a five-year period, and in some instances even longer than that if the if the permit isn't reissued. Um, as it expires. So that was the rationale that two per year seemed to be reasonable in terms of determining whether an effluent is toxic or a minimum level um, of monitoring. Was that when you considered that, were you basing that upon full time discharge, uh, year round discharges versus seasonal discharges? Yes, we considered both. And I believe we have, um, Zane, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we have the ability to go down to one per year if the discharge only occurs during a single quarter. Is that correct? I think or it's in a, is it still two? It's still two in a single quarter if they go down. But if it's okay. less, if it's less than, if they never discharge more than 15 days in any quarter, then it's really up to the regional board to kind of work with them and determine what monitoring they want them to do. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, on that, thank you for those clarifications. Um, obviously, we might have some disagreements on stuff, and we'll be putting that in writing. The the second question, I want to go back to uh, page five and, and some of the questions that Anne was asking um, regarding species and, and second species. And in and, and reading um, the different authority questions on authority, is, is there a potential in reading this or can you point me to where it would, would, where it says not to do this, that you might have a different species for a receiving water limitation and a um, effluent limitation. So I, I realize effluent limitation is very much most sensitive species, but I didn't see the, as this was re, re, re uh, Characterize or, re, or moved around. I don't see how. Um, I I couldn't find the section that basically said if it's a if you have a receiving water limit, you have to use the same species as an effluent limit. Yeah, I don't think that we have that in there, Elizabeth. No, we don't have that language. A regional board or, or state board could include a receiving water limit using a different species than that in your uh, effluent limit. Okay, so thank you. So, so in, in sort of answering Anne's question, so if the if the 
if a board wants to come along and, and there's no TMDL and they want a high level of the receiving water limit, they could add that or is it, are they only limited to one or could there be multiple um, species? We're silent on that. So potentially there could be multiple species for receiving water limitations. Okay. Um, that, those are my questions for now, thank you. Thank you. So I don't see any other hands up. John, do you have uh, questions beyond what Cameron already provided and said had been addressed? Do you have additional questions to list? Yeah, I just have one that hasn't been addressed already. So it's from Lorian Fono or Fano at Bakwa. And mm -hmm. she, oh, I thought you said something. Uh, so she's referring to a particular section in the provisions. So it'll take a minute for me to describe it. So bear with me. So section 4B2D2A2. And that section is called Reduced Routine Monitoring Schedule for Chronic Aquatic Toxicity. And she's referring to a paragraph on page 27. And it's the paragraph, so on page 27, there's a numbered list, one through four. And it's the paragraph just below that list. So she has a question about the last sentence. Uh, where we talk about reduced monitoring if you have high dilution. So did you find the section I'm talking about, Karen? Yep, yep. Okay. All right, so in this last sentence, we say that the frequency may be reduced from once per month to twice per year. If you have a dilution of at least 10 to one and the permitting authority requires a minimum of two additional monitoring tests conducted using the most sensitive species at double the IWC. And so her question is, what is the consequence of failing one of these two additional monitoring tests conducted at a concentration that is at least double the IWC? Well, because it's not conducted at the IWC, there cannot be a violation of the effluent limitation. And I'm hoping Elizabeth is gonna save me here pretty soon. Um, so that's correct, Karen. So there wouldn't be an effluent limitation violation from those um, two additional monitoring tests that are not conducted at the IWC. However, in the TRE, TRE section, there is language indicating that additional information, um, such as information from tests conducted at a different concentration than the IWC could be used to inform whether or not a TRE is needed. Um, so it's, uh, and I think it's to the regional board's discretion as to how they would want to consider that additional monitoring in that determination. Yeah. Thanks. Um, John, was there anything else on the email? No, there were a couple more, but they have been addressed already. Okay. And I don't see any other hands up. Is there anyone else on the Zoom meeting that would like to speak that hasn't got their hand up? No? Okay, well, um, I will say a few more sentences, waiting to see if anyone else puts their hand up. Um, first off, thanking you all for joining us on this Zoom platform, and uh, the, for, especially for those of you willing to share your videos. Uh, it's always nice to see faces going with the voices, and, and very nice to hear those of you uh, with your voices as well. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for uh, listening in and asking questions. And uh, I uh, look forward to seeing your comments in writing. Uh, also, if there 
is anything you would like to chat with us about offline, you're welcome to contact us and uh, schedule a separate meeting. We're happy to meet with anyone uh, to uh, provide clarification or discuss potential um, language that you're interested in providing. You know, so we're, we're happy to schedule meetings to chat with you, so let us know. Um, just as a quick reminder, comments are due by noon on August 24th, so please get them in timely and uh, we look forward to seeing them. And with that, I think I will close the workshop unless Rebecca, did you have something you wanted to add? No? All right. Just uh, so nice thanks. Nice to say hi and, you know, see everybody again. So just echoing your appreciation. So thanks, Karen. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll be hearing from and in touch with many of you between now and the, and uh, certainly between now and when the board uh, considers the provisions for adoption. So um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Uh, thanks for giving me an extra hour. I'm going to get on a different phone call. <laughs> uh, and that's all we had. I don't see any other uh Hands up, so we'll go ahead and close the meeting and uh, thanks. <laughs>